Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I am delighted to welcome back Dr. Shabir Akhtar. You're most welcome, sir. Thank you, Paul. For those who are uh, not familiar uh, with his work, uh, Dr. Shabir Akhtar is a philosopher trained at Cambridge University. He has published widely on pluralism and race relations in Britain and on Islam's and Christianity's differing responses to modern secularism. His books include Be Careful with Muhammad, Salman Rushdie and the Battle for Free Speech. The second edition of that is out now, by the way, and I'll link to it in the description below. And this is a classic critique of Salman Rushdie. He's also written a book called The Quran and the Secular Mind, one of my favorite books, and also Islam as Political Religion, the Future of an Imperial Faith is an absolute must read, all those three books. In 2018, he published the first of a three volume commentary on the Greek New Testament entitled The New Testament in Muslim Eyes, Paul's Letter to the Galatians, published by Rutledge. And I've studied this and it's uh, one of a kind. I uh, highly recommend that book as well. And he's currently a member of the Faculty of Theology and Religions at the University of Oxford. Now, before we address the question of what should be the Muslim response to the recent attack on Salman Rushdie on the 12th of August, um, Dr. Shabi Akhtar, could you share with us uh, the background to all this? I mean, who is Salman Rushdie? What's the deal with his novel, The Satanic Verses? And why is he such a, a controversial figure across the Muslim world? Well, Paul, um, Salman Rushdie is an Indian-born author, novelist, uh, studied in rugby and then in Cambridge King's College. He read history there, and which is where he came across the incident of the satanic verses, which is, in my opinion, a real incident by the way. Some Muslims dispute it. I think such an incident did, did take place. But of course, in his novel published in the autumn of 1988, he uses an arguably real incident in the history of Islam to make slanderous accusations about the book, saying it's a confused catalog of satanic verses, essentially, in the other sense, meaning the, the inspiration for the book is the, the devil, not God. Uh, and of course, there's a very detailed character assassination of the prophet in admittedly in dream sequences, but the mirror empirical, historical reality too closely to be seen as fictitious. Um, and uh, the following year, 1989, uh, there was a book burning at the beginning of uh, that, that year in January. I was involved with that. Indeed, right. approved of it. Yeah, I approved, approved of it. Yeah. It's legal, admittedly. It has overtones of what the Nazis did. But don't forget, the Nazis were in power. We were powerless, so there's no, no analogy whatsoever. Plus, we only burned one of his books. Indeed, one book. Uh, we didn't burn all the books of many writers of a particular ethnicity or religion. So it's a juvenile comparison made by his defenders. And then in um, February, there was a religious opinion, uh, a fatwa issued by a head of state, the late Ayatollah Khomeini. Well, a fatwa is, of course, normally a, uh, a legal opinion binding only on some people, those who follow the jurisprudence of that particular um, jurist, but it was issued by head of state, so it has great authority, and mm. there were obviously people who were going to implement it, which placed us in a dilemma because uh, we, as uh, you know, law-abiding citizens of mature democracies, by God, Britain is a very mature uh, democracy, have all the rights of religious freedom, so we couldn't uh, take the law into our on hand to act on implementing the execution of the author. But within the law, we did our best. And within broadcasting, I made many contributions and many pleas to people. It was the author, Ian McEwan, by the way, who took me aside from the studio when I first appeared. And I said to him, look, I feel great frustration. People are saying, you Muslims want to kill Salman Rushdie because you can't argue with him. Well, I, for one, can argue with him and I, I'm a philosopher. And I'm, I don't deny there are people who want to kill him, but I'm someone who can argue with him. And he said, okay, Mr. Akhtar, let me 
make sure that your voice is heard. And actually, that's what began my ability to publish The Guardian and lots of papers, The Independent. So I got my fair share of free speech, and I'm grateful for that. Um, so the fatwa was issued. There are, presumably, we may talk more about this later, parallels in you know Catholic canon law, response, uh, and in Jewish law too, the teshuva, which is a kind of response by a rabbi to an issue. But um, I'm sure Jews and Christians won't want to be associated with the word fatwa because they mistakenly think, many of them, despite being educated, that it means a death sentence. Yes. And in the dictionary, it even says in brackets, in some dictionaries, I hope it's been removed, death sentence on Salman Rushdie, as if a specific mm -hmm. word had been invented for him. So that's the background to what happened. Now, in the intervening years, uh, some 33, 34 years, it's a, you know, it's a long time. In my second edition of my book, published two years ago, right. it was on the occasion of the Charlie Hebdo uh, trial. And uh, I cover the entire debate since uh, 1990 onwards, meaning since you know the affair cooled down a bit, not much, it did cool down a bit. And the fatwa years when Rushdie was in hiding for almost a decade, Mm -hmm. And uh, showed much resolve and nerve. By the way, I should add parenthetically, sadly, no such reserve and resolve is shown by Muslims in the last two weeks. They seem to be queuing up to, to pray for Salman's entry into heaven, which surprises me coming from Muslims. So I'll be giving my view of what I think yeah. should happen. Is that enough uh, background, Paul? Well, I, I, as, as you know far better than I, well, one can give it almost infinite background to this. There's so many yeah. assets and complexities, political, literary, oh, uh, and social yeah. and religious. Uh, and we, we could go on for this for hours. But but certainly my, my, my impression as a, as a layman that I, I thought this whole issue of Salman Rushdie until the 12th of August, that fateful day earlier this month when he was brutally uh, assaulted in the United States. I thought the, this whole issue had kind of gone away. He, he appeared to be living a normal life. Well, not that I know him, but he, he didn't appear to be uh, living under some kind of curfew or anything. And then, uh, you know, perhaps it was, it was just a matter of history now. You know, what, what, what else is there to say? And then suddenly this attack, which uh, has possibly left him uh, incapacitated or having lost an eye and so on and then and then you, you get like president macron of france uh, i have the tweet here a copy of it he said for 33 years salman rushdie has embodied freedom and the fight against obscurantism he has just been the victim of a cowardly attack by the forces of hatred and barbarism his fight is our fight meaning france's it is universal so he thinks everyone should be involved as well. Now more than ever, we stand by his side, says President Macron of France. And the Western reaction, as far as I can judge it, not that I've studied this objectively, really, in general appears to be that there is an absolute right to freedom of speech when it comes to Rushdie and that he must be defended at all costs. And th th this strikes me as odd, oh, considering all the other things that are going on with freedom of speech and the woke culture and the cancellations and how there's a whole bunch of things you can't say anymore in the West, whether it be about, well, I'm not going to go down that path, but, you know, you can imagine what they are. For suddenly this to be the lightning rod of absolute freedom of speech struck me as curious, uh, to put it very mildly. So is this just about the absolute right to freedom of speech or is there more to this story, Dr. Shabir? The Rushdie affair was always a strategically a very important affair. It involved many dimensions, as you know, about the question of the assimilation of Muslims post Second World War in Western societies. Mm. It involved uh, tensions to do with ideology between Islam and the West, between a virtually omnipotent West and practically totally powerless Islam, which I believe is still the case. Um, let me make two comments. Firstly, on the macro thing, when my second edition was published two years ago, the French ambassador to Indonesia singled me out and attacked that book because I'd mentioned about the Charlie Hebdo affair. And um, again, as you know, you know, French people are very passionate about laicity, you know, about secularism. So he was outraged by a book trying to still explain at least the Islamic position on uh, secularism a topic I cover in great depth in Islam as political religion. Um, <clears throat> the second oddity, which I may mention at the beginning, is I'm a bit surprised that ironically in a in an in a, an affair about freedom of 
speech, freedom of information. How come there's a blackout and a censorship on Rushdie? I mean, two weeks have passed, we know practically nothing, you know, even factually. Of course, the interpretive uh, issues will always be controversial. There'll always be diehard fanatics um, who defend Rushdie's right to um, uh, freedom of speech, as if freedom of speech were an absolute um, principle in any culture at any time, let alone now, as you mentioned, with the uh, new sacred um, identity of transgender and sexual politics and whether we should have a third toilet. I mean, that seems to be quite sacred. No one dares to. No. I, wonder, I wonder if Rushdie is courageous enough. They, they say that he's speaking truth to power. Well, I'd like to know who the which power they're talking about. Muslims have no power. And he certainly doesn't speak truth to Western power with all the immoral foreign policies of Western governments, including particularly America, and sadly, increasingly, of Great Britain as a country that uh, allies itself to American foreign policy, which is outright uh, immoral. Yes, I, I mean, it's always struck, because I, I know about a year ago, Macron uh, took a great offence at... Um, uh, a billboard, I think it was somewhere here in the south of France, which uh, portrayed him uh, as a certain notorious German figure in the 1930s right. and uh, uh, mocking him. And this was during the election uh, period. Uh, and uh, and he, he took them to court uh, and uh, said, this is outrageous. How, how, how dare how dare a political opponent possibly portray me uh, uh, as this German figure? And he, he's disliked, uh, Macron is disliked by many people in France for his perceived arrogance and dictatorial Demeanor. So um, uh, Macron was very clear that freedom of speech shouldn't operate when it comes to public uh, satirizing of his own persona, his great persona. So it struck me as slightly uh, odd, to put it mildly, that he uh, sh should come out very strongly in favor of free speech when it comes to Salman Rushdie. And some people simply think that it might be a, 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 this might be like a, a Trojan horse for uh, for uh, criticism of Islam and Muslims, particularly living in the West and the whole issue of integration in France. And it's just an excuse to um, bash Muslims, basically, under the cover of this absolute right to freedom of speech. Do you think there's any... Yeah, well, I, yeah, of course, that's self-evidently true. But, you know, there are people who are professionally engaged in obscuring the truth about the ideological background to this. People such as... Um, this is not libelous to mention, of course. I mean, Douglas Murray, whom I debated in Cambridge and won by that, uh, along with Tariq Ramadan. Um, and there's Iron Ali. I mean, there's a whole industry based on Islamophobia. People make a lot of money out of attacking mm -hmm. Islam. Rushdie himself became extremely wealthy as a result of uh, uh, the, you know, attacking Islam. Sadly, this is a, a double standard. Yes, indeed. I think you're right that people... Uh, know that there are limits in law. And on a personal level, you know, Mr. Rushdie, uh, if you exercise any freedom, such as the freedom of speech, to an absolute degree, then automatically you put limits on competing rights, such as the right of mobility and going to the theatres in New York, because somebody might meet you on there and improve your manners. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, what is what should be the Muslim response to the recent attack on Salman Rushdie? So, uh, some Muslims, uh, I don't know, it could be just one or two or more, have have, have been very jubilant and uh, and uh, and uh, you know praised this attack. Uh, others have said no, that this is a freedom of speech issue. Uh, and others have condemned the attack uh, because, uh, well, Islamically, my understanding of Sharia. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is if we're living in a country like Britain, we should obey the law, uh, the Sharia says, uh, because we, we have a covenant with the powers that be to live a, a, an orderly uh, and law-abiding existence. So, yeah, obviously, as long as Muslims are not asked to do anything that is that's sinful, like, you know, eat pork or something, but otherwise we're to, to obey the law. What, 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 what is the appropriate Muslim response to this attack, do you think? Right. Well, I, I agree with you that, you know, we should live within the law of the land. And in fact, I mean, in my case here in Britain, uh, we live in a land that is actually given people extensive rights, uh, especially in the area of religious freedom. So we have no reason to complain. However, it must be said that laws can be unjust and need to be changed. Fortunately, in Britain, it's a mature parliamentary democracy. We do it through consensus and lobbying, not mm -hmm. through killing. It's a remarkable and good feature of British politics there. 
Many demonstrations took place. I went to many myself. Some got quite violent, but because our police is quite restrained, unlike other countries where demonstrations took place, and dozens of people were killed in Pakistan, in India, so on. Um, but in Britain, we've not had a single casualty in that way. And that's proof that the law protects everyone, us Muslims, as well as um, Rushdi. Having said that, it's obvious to me that people only need to demonstrate if they're powerless. No powerful person ever demonstrates on the streets. I've never seen Salman Rushdie demonstrating on the streets. Now, some of his supporters have, but Mr. Rushdie has a direct line to ministers, foreign ministers, foreign office, presidents. I mean, you, you can't compare his access and freedom of speech to someone like myself or any ordinary Muslim. We have very limited uh, access to freedom of speech. As I say, it was a coincidence in a way that Ian McEwan um, and Michael Ignatieff, the Canadian intellectual, gave me some space. A lot of her, like yourself. Um, yeah, absolutely. And to others, but, you know, uh, in the case of Ignatieff, there was private attempts to actually pull the program, the late show on which I appeared, and Michael told me that. He right. said, but I said to them, look, this is a principle too. If we're going to give absolute freedom of speech to some Rishi, we can't deny it to other citizens of this country, like Shibirakta. So, I mean, that's an honorable thing. And and I've always admired that a company tradition of fair play that we have, I think, largely in Britain, actually. I, I don't see such fair play in academic freedom in America, where I lived for 10 years, uh, or in France, for that matter. Um, so that's the first aspect of it. Now, the question about what Rushdie has actually done, the amount of harm he's caused, moral injury, if you like, um, not legal injury, because, you know, obviously it's within the law what he's done. But one can do things within the law which are immoral. And there's no question that what he's doing and has done and continues arrogantly to do is extremely immoral and wicked. I regard him as a megalomaniac uh, who has no concern about anyone. He'll drop any ally, even, you know, Western allies, if they offend him. And he's never had any respect for Muslims or for Islam. I think he's been forced to the negotiating table with that fake conversion and because of the the logic of power. I mean, Rushdie is a very powerful man with complete backing of a very powerful part of the world. So when Ayatollah Khomeini gave his fatwa, one thing, one corollary of that was that it forced Rushdie to certainly realize that this is a matter in the sphere of physical military power. It's not just him against illiterate, inarticulate peasants in Bradford, for example. And so that reason, I have no sympathy whatsoever by it because Rushti has uh, caused much bloodshed in the world. You might say, is it direct? Yes, I think it is direct causation. Books can uh, cause assassinations and killings. So I think he has to accept responsibility for what he has done morally, offer a more sincere kind of apology. Right now, he's just gloating in the fact that he is actually, after the president of the U.S., perhaps the most powerful man in the world. I mean, how many left-wing intellectuals, for example, who are critical of Western ideas and policies politically, get the kind of coverage he does? How often do you see Noam Chomsky, the brilliant um, Jewish-American uh, scholar, on TV talking about Israel? Well, Rushdie is everywhere. In fact, there was a time I was afraid to put on the TV because he's always around, isn't he? And what he's saying is um, incoherent. Um, and all his defenders... I find they're saying the same thing. There's no actual argument in what they're saying because the hypocrisy and double standards are so palpable. This, I think, might be the reason why. Yeah, can I just try and uh, present an argument? It's not necessarily my argument, of course. I'm just trying to present uh, uh, what some people out there might say. They say, look, look, look at Christianity uh, in, in recent decades. Say, in Britain, we've had um, the Life of Brian is a Monty Python film. We've had the public mocking of uh, Jesus Christ, uh, upon whom be peace, uh, in the media, in comedy, in stand-up comedians online. And Christians mostly take it with good, with good part. They say, look, we can, we can laugh at our religion and, and so on. So why can't Muslims also go along with this? Um, uh, again, I'll just stress this is not my personal opinion. But they're saying, look, the president has been set. Um, Christians now uh, t take these things that, you know, they, they take these knocks and these criticisms and satire without getting upset. So why can't Muslims follow this example? Um, that would be an argument that I have heard. Um, how would you as a, a Muslim philosopher and an expert on this whole 
sorry story. How would you respond to that? Well, the, the, the differences between Islamic and Christian ethics are quite fundamental. So I have great respect for Christian ethics, actually. And there are sincere followers of Christ who do take it seriously, the dominical demand, command by Jesus himself to his followers about loving enemies in Matthew, Matthew's gospel. But the problem is Islamic ethics is not Christian ethics. Our ethics is different. Our ethics, based on the beautiful example of the Prophet Muhammad, is you should repay good with something better, but you should repay just you should repay evil with justice. We don't love our enemies, and I personally think it's psychologically an incoherent idea, and I don't think it's right that one should love ideological enemies. You can love and forgive personal enemies. The Prophet did all the time. We have a complete list of the people who were executed during the least bloody revolution in human history, the conquest of Mecca. And the people executed were those who had attacked the word of God. The prophet, in fact, even forgave some incredible war atrocities against his own relatives done by the pagan uh, Meccans, which is why he, and he gave a general amnesty, which is why practically the entire city converted in a bloodless hmm. um, in a revolution. Uh, compare the French Revolution, all the revolutions, how bloody they've been. So we have to bear in mind that Christian ethics and Islamic ethics are different. Now, I'm not saying, by the way, I have great mm -hmm. sympathy with Christianity as a faith. My dogmas, obviously, as a Muslim, differ. But I, I'm not saying that Christian ethics is wrong on this point about forgiving enemies. I think in practice, very few people do or are capable of doing so. But Islam doesn't actually require us to forgive our ideological enemies. And therefore, I feel absolutely no sympathy or desire to uh, forgive Salman Rushdie. I think he's intransigent, obstinate, um, self-centered. And I think morally, he's a very unattractive person. Mm -hmm. So it's not to do with Islam only. Uh, I would have expected a bit more humility from him after the amount of bloodshed he's caused in the world and continues to do so. And of course, he has no, he doesn't care about the feelings of ordinary Muslims. Just think. The most despised people in France are the Muslim minority. And what have they got in their lives apart from religious values that give them some consolation and solace? So somebody goes and attacks that too. Already they're suffering from unemployment and racism, which is very blatant in, in France. I'm very glad to say Britain is actually quite a racially um, tolerant society. As I worked in race relations, I realized uh, how lucky I was to be in a country like England. And I also realized when Muslims would make casually anti-Semitic comments, all Jews are behind all this. Yes, there are sectorized Jews in the publishing industry, but the truth is that some of the people at the forefront of securing racial justice for Muslim minorities and all minorities were Jews. Many were friends of mine in the industry, race industry. So that's when I realized that we have to look for allies as Muslims too. Mm. So if you get conscientious, good, faithful Christians, and there are many like that, I know many, as friends and Jews, then we should work with them. But the point here is that this actually, uh, this whole Rishti affair is not really about freedom of speech because it's long been refuted, the argument that it's about that. And I think even his diehard fanatical defenders like like the elusive Keenan Malik, whose religion and background nobody knows, even they admit secretly, I'm sure, drunken parties, that it's not about that. It's just a way of um, giving pain to Muslims. It's a form of masochism, I say to masochism. Mm. I, I think a, a, another objection, again, uh, I'm not, it's not representing my personal views, but uh, other people do say that the, the notion of blasphemy, uh, uh, the offence of blasphemy is no longer part of um, British law. In fact, interestingly, it was until fairly recently, uh, actually, as was the notion of treason. Now, that both of these are kind of kind of gone from the British law. So that this is kind of like a, uh, a, a reintroduction of the blasphemy law, and not that Muslims are calling for this specifically, but the 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 implied condemnation of, of Rushdie seems to be bringing a notion of uh, the egregiousness of blasphemy back into the public square as something that is actionable. There's something that operates in the public domain. And for many secularists uh, in Britain, th this makes them uncomfortable because they think we should be free to mock uh, uh, religion, particularly Islam, as you say, get, gets the, the overwhelming brunt of this, and particularly as Christians now uh, seem to accept the mocking of their faith. I'm never quite sure why they should, but they seem to. 
But it, there seems to be this idea that blasphemy is now becoming a live issue. And a lot of people thought we put that to bed uh, and, and now it's coming back again. And, and that is something that how do you how do you reassure if you do reassure uh, those British people who feel this is something of concern? How do you communicate that this is actually a legitimate uh, you know, concern with blasphemy is an offence, an insult? against a sacred figure, put it that way, that this is something that shouldn't be tolerated in a society that is civilised, that shows well, I, mutual that's respect. Not, that's not my argument. But in my book, The Gift of Mama, which is a, the only truly liberal book on the affair, all the ones written by liberals were actually quite fascist and intolerant of Islam. My argument is and was that um, in a multicultural society, multiracial and so on, we shouldn't allow scurrilous literature that might lead uh, to tensions socially. So this problem can be dealt under public disorder, which is how it is actually dealt now. Uh, so I'm not asking for an extension of the blasphemy law. That wouldn't be workable. For historical reasons, only Anglicanism was protected. I gave a lecture at Lambeth Palace at the time, I met the Archbishop and received very sympathetic treatment from him. I also met with the uh, Chief Rabbi, again, privately, Everyone was saying, yes, we do have sympathy, but a blasphemy extension law doesn't work. And I, once I understood the niceties of English law, realized that that route wasn't open to us. But you see, the problem is that with Christianity and certainly with Jewish, Judaism, because it's a privileged place for Jewish suffering post-Holocaust, the thing is there were enough cultural sympathy and capital. What cultural sympathy does Muhammad have? So if you don't even have the law to protect him, even under you know, secular legislation, public disorder, and no blasphemy protection. Of course, that's natural. This is a Christian nation, historically. Uh, then, then what restrains people? Remember, there's cultural respect for Christianity. In fact, I think uh, the reason for the decline of Christianity, dogmatically in the United Kingdom, is because of its extraordinary moral success. We accept compassion, national compassion, national service. For example, you know, it's a good country to be poor and sick in, by the way, unlike, you know, say in America, where Rishi is quite telling that he left England and went to America, which, which suits him. It has the temperament that he has, I'm so to say, rather teenage juvenile temperament politically that, you know, you can just bomb people, kill people, assassinate people. And by the way, on the assassination attempt, may I just add that, you know, Americans and Israelis and and, and Britain too, sacred services, successfully carry out assassinations all the time. I mean, in the time of this Rushdie attack, there have been countless Muslims murdered, killed without any jury or trial. So why are we so concerned about the rights of this one man? What about all the Muslims who are killed routinely and uh, by drone attacks? No one condemns that, Rushdie doesn't. I mean, like Christopher Hitchens, Rushdie began as a left-wing uh, yeah. person, you know, critical of British racism and so on. But then now, meaning after uh, the, the satanic versus affair, he's become completely and uncritically pro-Western. There's lots of Western critics who admit that there are double standards in Western attitudes about freedom of speech and larger issues about foreign policy, whereas he is rather obstinately in a childish way saying it's all about my freedom. It's not, by the way, freedom of speech. I think Rushti is agenda is his own freedom of speech. I don't think he cares much for the freedom of speech of other rival writers, like myself, let's say. You know, if I was trying to say something, I don't think he'd be very keen. I know of many cases where he's tried to prevent certain works being published which were critical of him. So that's a clear double standard. And of course, the man's a hypocrite. That's a, that's it, seems a, be, it seems to be implying what you're, you're saying is that there is, perhaps in human nature, uh, uh, perhaps amongst many people, that we are attracted to power uh, and, and what, 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 you know, American power, if this is the current, obviously, hegemony of the current world uh, leader. Uh, and, and that it's, it's easy to go along with it and you can get preferment, you can get praise, you can get a, yeah. a, a lucrative job, you can get celebrated as he is in Salman Rushdie in New York and so on, affected as a, a celebrity and all the publicity and the money and the, uh, the beautiful wife and everything else. And this is hugely temp tempting. It's very attractive and why not? You know, but maybe, you know, it's kind of the greasy pole. Um, and maybe that's why some of these people who were, as, as you say, you mentioned a couple of figures, you know, got quite critical of the double standards suddenly become 
rather at home in the very world that they had criticised before. Right, absolutely. I mean, when you assess this matter morally and according to Quranic standards, then the correct position to sum up uh, Paul on this, the yeah. actual guidance for Muslims, uh, is that uh, while we cannot condone you know, the attack on him, right. uh, because we live in societies where adherence to these, these laws benefit all of us. I mean, after all, um, by and large, even after 9-11, I mean, Americans showed restraint. They, there wasn't mass killings of the kind that would have happened in India, let's say, if there'd been a Muslim terrorist attack. They would have got communal violence straight away and thousands would have died. We didn't have that. So I think that the responsible position is, and this is my own position, I think it's the only correct position, incidentally, is that while we have no sympathy with him because of his record of what he's done, we cannot encourage our youngsters and militants settled here to uh, carry out such attacks. But I do not think that Rishti is an example of freedom of conscience even. I don't think he has a conscience, in fact. Um, I support people who conscientiously differ from me, uh, you know, like the many Christians do. And I think this is not a matter of conscience. Mm -hmm. uh, besides, um, conscience is the right to do the right thing. Conscience is not the right to act in an evil way. No. So if Hitler, for example, had a conscience, that doesn't make him a man of integrity because he's evil. And again, you know, the principles involved here, the point is that Nothing is wrong about an extreme principle, like extreme principles such as absolutely insisting on freedom of speech. Or in our case, our extreme limiting principle is the unnegotiable honor of the Prophet Muhammad. Nothing wrong with extremism. Question is, what's the content of the extreme view? If it's true, you should defend it. What's wrong with extremism is that it's factually untrue. So, for example, when Muslims say privately sometimes, or oh, Jews are behind this, you know, I reject that because there's no empirical evidence for it. And so that I regard as an extreme opinion on the grounds that it's a mistaken opinion. Nothing wrong with extremism, by the way, if you're being extreme about the right things. Like, for example, I believe in absolute standards of justice. I'm a, a disciple of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. it, it, it just seems to me that uh, th this emphasis that uh, Macron uh, placed in his tweet on the absolute right to freedom of speech is just so selective that a whole raft of other freedom of speech issues where he doesn't support yeah. any freedom of speech. And these are, you know, on issues of morality, issues of yeah. secularism, issues of the lamp lampooning of himself uh, during political elections and, you know, lampooning uh, politicians, you know, Hogarth did it in England famously with his cartoons. You know, this is kind of part of the Western tradition. And he took the guy and prosecuted him, you know, because he is a president of France. I, 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 was, I was just personally stunned at the incongruity, the inconsistency as you call it, the hypocrisy of standing up on this one example in such absolute terms. But on all these other examples, um, th th this issue wasn't in any way flagged up, the right to freedom of speech. And I, I thought that was just very, very curious. And how few people have noticed, I mean, Muslims have noticed this, of course, you have. But in the, in the general media, how few people have remarked on that incongruity and that inconsistency and that hypocrisy. People are not saying, how can you say that Macron, given all these other things? People are not saying that. They're saying, well, we stand, it's like you know, Downing Street, we stand with Salman Rushdie, blah, blah, and not noting the double standards going on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it's, it's been a very juvenile reaction from, from Western thinkers. A big disappointment to me, actually, because I'm very keen to engage the West's uh, intellectual traditions because I like the fact that while there's much criticism of Islam and rejection, there's always been an accompanying honorable tradition of scholarship in the West, particularly in Britain, uh, which has been very fair to Islam as well, increasingly, I think, in the last 30, 40 years, you know, post-Orientalism. Um, I think the other difficulty here is that uh, it's difficult to know how to move out of this deadlock. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, what we have now, I mean, I, I have colleagues at the University of Oxford who have never seen this issue as being one in the sphere of power. They all think it's simply to do with one man's literary right. Exactly. Exactly. Very frustrating for me, but I realize that this is a matter, you know, a clash of civilizations, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, as I say, you know, we have responsible legislation in this country. I'm not uh, working to, you know, I personally don't think that any 
parliamentary change needs to be made. Just needs to be implemented fairly on the you know question of public yeah, discourse. Yeah. yeah, and um, these extremist views are held by there's a whole sort of um, group of people who are making a good living out of it. You know, INS, CLE, etc., Keenan Malik, the, the standard Islamophobes. You mentioned Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray's books are, um, he's an English uh, commentator. He's a conservative or right winger. He's, uh, he happens to be, he calls himself an atheist, a gay atheist, but he right. has a, a great uh, track record when it comes to attacking Muslims. Uh, uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, Tim Winter at Cambridge University, who uh, he publicly called for his dismissal from Cambridge University simply because uh, Professor Abdul Hakim Murad expressed the the orthodox Sunni view on sexuality, and this was seen as something. So he he sought to deplatform and cancel um, that that uh, Muslim uh, esteemed Muslim scholar, and, and yet uh, Murray will speak out for freedom of speech when yeah. it comes to Salman Rushdie. So you you see, you see that this is not a consistent, fair, objective ethic. It's slants in the particular mm-hmm. worldview, which is the the Western clash of civilizations narrative that you just mentioned? Well, I mean, I would add on this point that because I've been trained as a philosopher and lived most of my life among agnostics and atheists, I actually have a lot of respect for the secular humanist tradition, what's good in it, which means that I don't respect people like Richard Dawkins, mm. whose work I find to be very shallow. And by the way, a couple of days ago, he was in Cologne um, carrying a big portrait of Salman Rushdie, saying, really? yeah, this is the man we need to defend. The new creed of him and uh, many ex-Muslims, who, by the way, are very uh, angry about the attack, ex-Muslims, and are supporting seeing Salman as a, like a hero, a martyr, uh, a saint, in fact. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that um, these types of people, ex-Muslims, for example, why do ex-Muslims call themselves ex-Muslims? If you've left a faith, Call yourself by some other. But of course, it's politically very convenient to keep on saying, oh, by the way, I left Islam, because that makes you very valuable in the media, right? Somebody who left Islam, who can then, you know, say things about Islam which are negative. It makes so, them experts, of course, as well. For some absolutely. reason, it eludes me. If you become an ex something, you're an expert of it. I'm not sure why. But. Yeah, I mean, Richard Dawkins' uh, uh, principle or dogma used to be, there's no God, but Richard Dawkins is his prophet. Yeah. Now, now I think the new kalima for it's, Richard Dawkins is there's no, no Salman Rushdie, Rushdie is, is, is the problem. Is the problem. Yeah. Now, I mean, this is a point about morality too. I mean, you know, the idea that Muslims or other religious people like Christians, uh, practicing Christians, have empty lives and so on. Well, this is ironic. How fulfilled are the lives of people like Hanif Qureshi? Most, he mentions dope all the time openly, and presumably alcohol is, of course, not even a drug anymore, is it? Um, what does he fill his life with? You know, alcohol and indiscriminate offers of sex? Mm-hmm. I wonder if that's a more honourable way to live. I just, I just want to mention, by the way, the French edition of Be Careful with Mohammed, uh, Salman Rushdie and the Battle for Free Speech, uh, will be out in October, inshallah. This is, I say, the French edition of the English work uh, which is now in its second uh, edition that's uh, obviously well, one can get hold of that now and I'll, I'll link to it in the uh, description below and I think it's particularly interesting that you're bringing out a French edition but was there a particular reason for that rather than say yeah. I don't know a yeah. German one or an Italian yeah. one or Spanish one yeah right well I mean Natu Shibar Mohammed the title of the new book because I think France is uh, an example of a nation that is um, got a brutal record of colonization of the Muslim world with no apology, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the way, on that point, you know, in case I'm accused of double standards, I've often said to Muslims that uh, the fact that the North African church, which was there at the time of the Islamic, early Islamic conquest of the 8th century, I think we Muslims, if insofar as we behave badly, don't think we did. I think there was a principle involved in the Quran Sunnah of protecting the, the, you know, the Jewish and Christian religion. But insofar as people didn't, I think we do. Uh, you should be repentant about that and openly say to Christian colleagues that, for example, in the murder of some monks in Algeria, now that's completely wrong by Muslim militant. And so I'm just saying, you know, this double standard issue is, is as I say, well, a one of morality for me as a, a man who's utterly just because I'm following the Quranic command, mm. uh, which was implemented by the Prophet of Islam. 
So, you know, I'm not saying by the, in any of this, any kind of self-righteous um, view that, you know, Muslims are a perfect community. No. And in fact, Rushdie in some of his novels, like the novel called Shame, does expose hypocrisy in the Pakistani elite uh, very ably. And no one was upset about that, except the Pakistani elite, of course, because we know we are human. There is hypocrisy. In fact, there's an excellent novel by an historian, David Cote, C-A-U-T-E, called Fatima's Scarf, which was written actually about the characters um, in uh, um, Bradford, including me. I'm satirized there. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a wonderful right. novel. Uh, but the point is, I actually endorse David Cote's novel. David Cote is a very uh, well-known left-wing historian. He couldn't find a publisher for that novel, by the way. But it's uh, written with humor. It doesn't descend into obscenity. It satirizes me a great deal. It's easy to recognize that it's me is, is satirizing. And other figures that he, he brings into it who are actors in this uh, whole drama. But I endorsed it because I'm human. I have feelings. But I do defend a holy exemplar which is the prophet. Uh, that, for me, is unnegotiable, um, just as freedom of speech is unnegotiable for my critics and our enemies. And of course, there are new sacred uh, sacred cows, as some people call them, yes. in the West now, which you can't right. criticise. And yes. it's not just that, you know, you, you, people will frown at you, that you can be arrested, you can yeah, be yeah, charged yeah. Um, and prosecuted, and you can go to prison. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and in extreme cases, um, like Julian Assange, who, um, yeah. whose big crime was to actually uh, expose some very serious American war crimes uh, during the war in Iraq, um, he is still rotting in a prison in London, waiting extradition to the United States. So, you know, um, there, there are lots of uh, free speech limits uh, which are arguably not just on on this, but coming back to the yeah. French tradition of be careful with Mohammed. So, you, you wanted to come out of France particularly because of its colonial history, its uh, highly questionable record, shall we say, in yeah. its relations with Muslims and treatment of Muslims in France. Is that the, the main reason? Well, yeah, that and because you know France has a history of, of crusader mental. Remember, the Crusades started in France in the eleventh century. In October, the first, second, third crusade. Britain also, of course, Richard the Um, But I think the current situation of French Muslims is deplorable. Mm -hmm. Deplorable. And, uh, you know, unemployment and uh, so much um, marginalization. Only thing of value in their lives was, is faith, and that's been attacked too quite um, uh, brutally by, and at government level. You know, if this was just right wing thugs doing it, it'll be different. But the government, Macron himself, has openly condemned Islam as a religion of terrorism. So we need to, I should add by the on this freedom of speech, the use of speech, Professor Jordan Peterson, oh, yeah. Canada, you know, one of our great intellectuals at the moment, I'm a fan of his, um, he has pointed out the Canadian government has even tried to legislate certain expressions, you know, to do with the gender question. Pronouns and so on. Yeah, you know what I'm saying, you know, pronouns, yeah, plus one. Yeah. And he very bravely took on uh, the, the government. And also the other sacred cow is attacking Islam on the feminist questions of patriarchy. Again, I think Peter Johnson is a great ally. Peter Johnson is Christian. Uh, I, I'm not certain about that, but I believe he's Christian. Um, and he's the type of Christian which I think we can all admire for his courage. Mm -hmm. No, in, indeed. Um, so, um, so this is coming out in October, this uh, work in... Yeah. France. Um, will it be translated in any other languages or is that the main one at the moment? Well, I'm interested in in having translations in Spanish particularly. It's yeah. a language that's widely spoken, of course. It's the language of identity of more people than in a, even of English, which is mainly a language of communication, not of identity. Right? Lots of, everybody speaks English, but that doesn't mean they're English or or even British. Um, Spain, Spanish context is important because my work on liberation theology, Islamic liberation theology, you know, the book you mentioned, Islam as political religion, I think it would appeal to the to the Spanish, Hispanic speaking nations of Latin America mm -hmm. who have been uh, treated very badly by Christians up in America. And America is a deplorable mm -hmm. record, which of course, to be fair, Rushti has in the past Condemned. I mean, I'm not saying that Rushdie is indifferent to American excesses. I think he's critical of Trump, for example, mm. uh, was critical of Trump. So to be fair to him. And some of his early work on uh, countering racism 
was excellent. I should say another surprise. You know, apart from the fact that the apostates of Islam have now made Rushdi into their prophet, it came as a surprise to me. Another mm -hmm. surprise I find is that the most insightful um, stance being taken on the Rushdi current affair, you know, the stabbing, this particular trajectory which it has now assumed in 2022, is by those people who are in the area of post-colonial studies. And I think they see the power dynamic. Yes. Many of them are secularized Muslims, or not Muslims at all, but, I mean, you find that in their work there's an awareness that this is to do with power and real politics. It's not to do with some abstract, yes. um, innocent issue of literature. I, I think the asymmetry of power is, is a key point here, but also that there appears to be no respect for the sacred anymore. I mean, by sacred, I mean the actual religious sacred rather than the new sacred cows, which um, yeah. we can't criticise. So there is the asymmetry of power uh, allied with the uh, permissibility of um, de defaming and insulting uh, uh, sacred people, whether it be Jesus or Muhammad or whoever, yeah. or peace. Th th this kind of lethal combination weaponizes um, abuse. Uh, as you say, there isn't also this cultural capital, I think you mentioned earlier, with uh, the Prophet Muhammad in the West. You know, he, he's not, he's, yes. there's, no, uh, there's no tradition of reverence. There's for no him. informal respect for him. Yeah, at all. So he's just seen as someone who could be uh, viciously abused verbally or in well, writing. He's seen as somebody who was uh, a pedophile and a terrorist. Mm -hmm. Which of the founder of a world faith is described routinely in that way? Yeah, yeah, he's, a, he's probably the most. I think I've read somewhere he's the most maligned religious that, uh, yeah. in the history of the world. Uh, he, he's yeah. I, I actually no, the, one of those loved the religion. Yeah, sorry, Paul, to interrupt you. But, maligned, but on the other side, by his followers, true followers, and how few are those? He's generally loved and admired too. I mean, in early Islam, you see that. Uh, sadly, not anymore. In the last fifty years, I think Muslims have also lost respect for their prophet. I mean. When you look at the history of the Rushdie affair, the Arab world is conspicuously absent. All the uh, demonstrations were done by Southeast Asian people, people you know, Pakistanis, like myself, uh, were settled in the diaspora and by officially by Iran. Which Arab country has taken any kind of stance on Rushdie to empower us? No one. So, so well, there been no, 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 not even the Turkish president? Did he speak out publicly? I don't know. As a question. Oh, yeah, of course, you might be right. Erdogan. Not sure. uh, yeah, he, he might have, because he, he, he would do, I suspect. Yeah, he he I don't know. You know, there's such a censorship of this story in the Western media, ironically, that I, I just don't know the facts, let alone what the controversies are. I do hear the loud voices of, uh, indignant voices of Keenan Malik and other people uh, saying, of course, repetitive, there's no actual argument there. I should say, by the way, that on a religious note, since I'm a I'm a religious person, although I don't look religious. So I guess to acquire a reputation for piety and learning as a Muslim, <laughs> without a beard is a bigger achievement than if I had a big beard. I've seen many men with big beards who actually are not particularly religious and certainly have no feelings for the prophet. It's been a big disappointment for me. I won't mention names, but I, I think we all know who they are. And I, I think a lot of ordinary Muslims have lost respect for their leadership. I get into the taxi here in Oxford. Taxi drivers, by the way, are the best sort of amateur philosophers in the world. <laughs> I, like talking, I like talking to them in preference to my actual colleagues. <laughs> I find taxi drivers are much It's a great compliment to the uh, taxi drivers of Oxford, that they are uh, they're, they're yeah. lay philosophers. Well, I, I don't restrict it to Oxford. Whenever I go to a new city anywhere in the world, I <laughs> travel widely, I always say to the academics there, please don't come and collect me at the airport. <laughs> yeah, no, I do. I want to hear something real and authentic and not the fake rubbish that most intellectuals speak. That's a lovely, that's a lovely story. Well, perhaps we can uh, perhaps conclude it there. I mean, we could go on for hours because there's, as as we said before, there's so many facets, cultural, history, uh, yeah. personal, literary, and so on. Uh, yeah. and well, never... may I add something, though, on the religious side, because to me, this whole thing is about my faith in God and the mm -hmm. prophet. Mm -hmm. That's it. And I can finish you unless you want to ask something specific. Uh, there's a surah in the Quran called Abu Lahab, one of the short Meccan revelations, which is the only surah which singles out an enemy of the prophet by name. You know, the Quran is a very detached scripture. You know, it describes people by definite description. Here he's mentioned Abu Lahab, father of the flame, not his actual name. And it says, Tabbat Yada. Abi Lahab, what tab? 
May the hands of Abu Lahab perish and may he perish. Notice the sequence. First his hands must perish, then his actions are invalid and he will perish. And it goes on to talk about hell, the fire of hell. And I often think of, I've always actually for many years now thought of Salman Rushdie when I read that, that perishes works. There's inferior literature that is produced mm. in the satanic verses and may he himself perish spiritually though, as I say, um, Americans and Israelis and British. I will leave it to them to carry out efficient assassinations with the afterwards denied, by the way, until the documents are declassified three decades later. And they say, yeah, yeah, we did it. Right, big deal. You know, we're powerful. But at the time, contemporaneous with it, they always deny it. Yeah. No, this is this is uh, the, another example of the inequality or asymmetry of power between the, the West and the rest, particularly the Muslim world. Um, I understand you're working on uh, a sequel, the sequel to your uh, book on Paul's letter to the Galatians, a book that I uh, really uh, value, actually. Can you tell us a bit about it and when it will be published? Uh, well, you know, all these academic works, uh, or as you know, uh, they, they take longer than one anticipates. And one of the reasons for that, by the way, is that academia in the area of humanities, that is, and religion does not have any seminal ideas. All seminal ideas are produced outside the academy. I mean, Paul wasn't a professor of systematic theology at Oxford, was he? Thank God he wasn't. Yeah. And you know, Galatians is his, is his letter, authentic. And I wrote a commentary, many people, of course, there's lots of extraordinary commentaries. On. Yeah, but you're the first Muslim uh, academic. I'm the first Muslim. Muslim. You, you, you have that ex extraordinary uh, honor of being the first to do. I do, I do indeed, because I have Greek classical and uh, mm. devoted Greek. The second volume is a is, is a book on Lucan, Lucan Christology, which I regard as low, and for which I think I've excited some very adverse opinion in the faculty here. But I think, just, to, just, so just to translate that into demotic, to use that word in English, um, yeah. meaning that, that Luke portrays Jesus of Nazareth as a human being and not as God, basically. I think that's what you're trying to say. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. And I think it's fully compatible with the Quran. And actually, I think one of the great glories of Islam of the Quran is that it uh, recognizes and affirms Judaism and Christianity. Because if it hadn't, it would have been a puzzle for me. I would have thought, well, I've got lots of, you know, decent Christians with very high levels of spirituality, but my scripture says they're not right. I think Christians have a great problem, as do Jews. How do you explain the authentic uh, spirituality of Muhammad? I mean, there's no question that he was a sincere messenger of God, sent from God, as many um, Islamophobes such as Keenan Malik and Salman Rushdie will find out. I mean, Salman Rushdie is one leg in the, in the grave now, so I'm not sure what, what basis he has for any further arrogance. I think it's time for him to, to apologize to the Muslim world well, and to start writing children's books, which are just as lucrative, by the way, as the satanic verses. So, sorry, coming back to your uh, yeah. commentary on uh, Luke, uh, Luke Christology. Christology. Um, well, when might that be published if you have uh, a time scale? Available? Well, I have a contract for it with the outlets, who, by the way, have asked me that question too many <laughs> times. You know, uh, well, inshallah, you know, God willing, it should be out uh, very early uh, next year. Ah. But, you know, with publishers, sometimes they promise it in their catalogs. Uh, January the 1st, which is the actual date they've given. But I think in practice, more likely to be in spring. It's a pretty major work. I mean, I think um, <laughs> at the, you know, the risk of being self-congratulatory, it will be a monument in Christology. I, I, I genuinely look forward to uh, getting my hands on a copy. It's obviously a, in, an area of great interest for me as well. Uh, just just on, on that subject, I mean, are you, uh, is this a double, another double first? Will you be the first Muslim scholar to have written a commentary on Luke's gospel in history? Or, or, or not? Well, I, well, I was the first to do it on a Pauline epistle. Yes. yes, actually, it is the case. No, however, in another sense, uh, we do have commentaries from colonial India where oh. people were interested for that from Luke's gospel in, in response to missionaries. But the problem is none of them had the privilege of the languages because studying Christian origins is hard work. Uh, you know, you need obviously Hebrew, 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 a smattering of Aramaic, you know, for the Old Testament, these two languages. You need Greek um, 
colloquial demotic Greek, not classical. The New and, Testament. And German, presumably. Well, well, you, st you also need Latin mm. for the early, you know, for the Vulgate and for, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you need the Septuagint in Greek. Yes, German is very distinguished in language for biblical scholarship. I'm saying you need a lot. With Islam, you can just suffice. Mm. You can survive on classical Arabic alone. I mean, my reading knowledge of, of Arabic philosophers, particularly, you know, my specialties have been rushed in very ways. But, you know, as I say, I'm not an Arab by culture. Mm. Oh, well, I'm very much looking forward to, to that. Well, perhaps um, well, we will draw it to a, a close. Um, and uh, just to give you my sincere thanks, uh, Dr. Shabir Akhtar, as a philosopher uh, at the University of Oxford, although you trained, I think, at the University of Cambridge. Um, and um, I'll, I'll link to uh, the book uh, on uh, Muhammad. Um, be careful with Muhammad, I should say. Salman Rushdie on the Battle for Free Speech, the second edition out now. And we look forward to... Uh, the French edition coming out in October, and I'll get a copy of that as well. I'll be interested to see, keep my eye on how that does here in France. Um, hopefully it will, it will make a splash and will be reviewed by the French media here, inshallah. So uh, thank you. Well, I hope somebody will burn it. That, <laughs> that sales, yeah. Well, you never know, Macron may tweet about it and say, yeah. why is this book being published in my country or whatever? <laughs> I don't know. Right. Um, we never know. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your time, and I wish you well. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.